it's, it's really a great pleasure to be able to speak about food allergies and EOE. And Anne asked me to come and speak about the disease a little bit, but also about the impact that allergies may have and also make it somewhat interactive. So we'll spend some time speaking about patients and try to get some of y'all's opinions about things too. Um, in, in constructing the slides today, I really didn't get the opportunity to um, make uh, uh, all the objectives that we may want to know. And I think if you, there are three things, three really important things to remember as a part of my presentation today. I think the first is there's a difference between food allergies and sensitization to foods, okay? And we use RAS testing and things like that a lot, and we say if you have a positive RAS test, you have a food allergy, but all a RAS test does is, is test for sensitivity, and so that's a real important point. And sensitivity for anaphylactic reactions, okay? And then along with that, the second point is that we're only as good as the, the tests that we have available to work with, and, and within this disease, we're real limited because we have RAS and we have some skin tests, but we don't have great tests for the actual food allergies and how they may participate <clears throat> in the disease pathogenesis. And the, the third thing is that um, I've been really impressed with the program. I think it's great. But certainly for my presentation, one of the mo most important people who's a part of the team is the dietitian. And uh, I think throughout the course of, of the uh, discussions of the presentations today, it, it keeps ringing through that you must have a dietitian in place, at least as a part of our practice, because all of the detail that goes into the planning and, and, and caring for the patients really demands the, the presence of a dietitian. So anyway, those are the three most important points, and we could probably just stop there. Yeah. All right, so uh, the first slide I wanted to start with, and, and you know, we work in the lab, we're trying to understand how these diseases happen, and, and I wanted to start with this. It'll be the only basic slide that I'll really show, but it's really, the gut is just an amazing organ. And, and I want you guys to all put your fingers, your thumb and your index finger, as close as you can together without touching them. And that's about as thick as the epithelium is. And that epithelium separates everything inside the lumen and all the nutrients you're going through and everything else that you eat during the day from the rest of your body. And remember, your gut contains about two kilos of bacteria it's come up a couple of times during the course of the discussion today, so it's really an amazing interface, and almost everything that has been discussed at each one of the sessions, as, a, as I'm listening to them, it kind of starts and ends at that epithelial surface. You know, the absorption, the immune responses, all the things that we've been discussing happen right there. <clears throat> and, and I bring it up because I think as, as um, physicians and, and researchers and clinicians, you make the observations of what we need to know to help improve the care of our patients and what those barriers to care are. And so think about that during the course of, of your uh, daily practice. Are there things that might be able to be done to, to think about new ways to caring for patients that really start at that epithelial surface? Okay, so um, I'll, I have two patients that I want to present, and then we'll return to them toward the end of my presentation today, and we can have, like I said, open discussion about it and talk about really um, the, the nuts and bolts of caring for patients. And in contrast to almost all the other presentations today, as you know, there's just not a lot of literature yet, uh, certainly about food allergies and eosinophilic esophagitis. And, and so some of the things that I'm going to show you, we're just saying how often it occurs, how often are there food allergies, and how have you measured them, and things like that, how you test for them. But we really don't have you know, decades of data and, and, you know, when Sam was presenting his work and showing, you know, the longitude and outcomes, we, we just don't have that yet. So we really are trying to use common sense and, and, uh, and thinking about how to care for patients over time. So this is a, a two-year-old boy, has a one-month history of vomiting, irritability with feeding, food aversion, slow weight gain, uh, had comorbid conditions of eczema and anaphylactic food allergy to peanuts, and it failed treatments with proton pump inhibitors and gone through a number of different formulas, cow's milk and, and soy-based. And um, his diagnostic evaluation included an upper endoscopy. He had linear furrowing, and we're not going to go into a lot of the clinical features of EOE during the, my presentation today, but I, I would just say that there are no pathognomonic features 
of eosinophilic esophagitis that we know of to date. So furrowing, it's edema. You can see that with any kind of esophageal disease. It's really important to, to remember the exudates. You can see that with inflammation. So we had furrowing. Uh, and then a pathology had 47 eosinophils per higher power field and a proximal distal mucosa, basal cell hyperplasia, normal gastric and duodenal mucosa, and a normal pH impedance study. And, and we can come back to these toward the again to, to speak about the utility of the different testing. But in total, all these things together, a, a patient who has symptoms, has inflammation, has failed different kinds of, of treatments, as uh, mucosal eosinophilia and tests that have ruled out reflux, all those things together really fit for a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. So um, what are the key features of this patient's disease are not necessary to monitor? And it's a little bit of a trick question. We'll, we can talk about you know, what we think of, and there are a lot of philosophies that go along with that, but why don't we go ahead and answer these questions. I need to do anything? No. Okay, it's going? All right. That's an esophagram. See, it's on its side there. It's going down. It's going down. Great. Look at that. Beautiful. Okay, well, I think it's pretty obvious that people are continuing to go for a barium esophagram. And I think this is one of the things, and if you'll notice on here, I actually didn't put histology. I didn't put numbers of eosinophils. I, I think it probably is, certainly is a part of our practice important to, to document that we've um, induced a clinical and a histological remission. It's important for us to monitor growth and development for feeding behaviors and obviously the calorie, protein, micronutrient intake. And, and I list all of these because every patient that we meet, the families or the practitioners, the people who refer patients to us, ask us these same questions. So what do you monitor? How do you track patients over time? And, and as I said, there are going to be a lot of different philo philosophies about how you do this and what you monitor. But certainly we talk about maintaining normal growth and development. That's kind of the sine qua non of pediatrics, something Kay Motil taught me decades ago. And and, um, and so that's the number one goal. And the barium esophagram, I put that up there because I think it is a test that's very helpful for many of our, evaluating many of our patients. And I think it's useful to analyze, uh, to see if you're concerned about a stricture or a narrowing because they can't always be identified as well endoscopically. But it's not something we're necessarily gonna monitor on an ongoing basis. Second patient, 17-year-old boy, three-year history of uh, dysphagia, food sticking, especially pills. I mentioned this part of things, chew, chewing food thoroughly, especially meat, drinking food, fluids to wash the food down, because you need to ask two questions when you're interviewing patients who you're thinking about this disease. If you say, do you have a problem swallowing, they may say no, but if you ask these other questions, you'll get yes, yes, yes. And it happens regularly, and you, you have to ask two questions, so please remember that. Comb over the history of food allergies, family history of allergies, and food sticking. The diagnostic evaluation in this patient, primarily because of the food that was sticking and, and continuing to hang up, and especially the pills, was a barium esophagram, a proximal stricture was present. At the time of endoscopy, it was visualized, and there was tracheolization, and the same pathologist was on. It was in the 40-ish mood, and 40 ADS in the fills per high power field with degranulation of microabscesses and normal gastric mucosa. So what treatment could be effective in achieving clinical and histological remission for this patient? Topical steroids, elemental formula, dietary restrictions based on allergy testing, six food elimination diet, or all of the above. Great, yeah, I think it's okay, there you go, you got a little topical steroids. Not thinking maybe maybe uh, not shooting for dietary, dietary approaches as much. So you know this I think points out a couple of different things. One is all of these certainly can be effective in achieving a clinical and histological remission. And this is probably the second philosophical point <clears throat> that certainly within our practice we try to individualize the care um, when you start to speak about 
the uh, nutritional management of patients, it's not always as straightforward. You do need to have a dietitian that's going to be able to help out in, in managing that. You do need to have an allergist. If you're going to embark on that, who's going to think about food allergies and testing and, and how to interpret those over time. So um, there are a number of different ways to do them that will look at some of the data that shows the, the clinical and histological response. But I think the answer to this is certainly all of these could induce it, but you need to think about the other parameters that surround this. And I think <clears throat> probably most importantly, the thing that we've learned now over time is that quality of life is, is critical in thinking about what the, what the care is. All right, so uh, just a few slides about eosinophilic esophagitis to remember that there were initial set of consensus recommendations that came out in 2007. And that was published because there was a lot of um, different ways that people were making the diagnosis. This isn't the absolute standard of care, except to say that it, it does set a certain benchmark. And we felt like that was important to get about 30 some odd different people together to, to think about that, to. For, for ongoing um, treatment and, and research, but this is uh, a moving target. It's something that changes with the more we, more we know. And, and actually, there was a second round of these recommendations that was published last summer that started to address some of the deficiencies that were identified in the first. The most updated recommendations state that eosinophilic esophagitis is a clinical pathologic disease, meaning you need to have symptoms as well as an abnormal uh, histopathology. The pathology is at least one or more biopsy show there's greater than 15 eosinophils. That was based on a very long conversation with pathologists who felt like that was kind of the lower limit of number that they could use to distinguish this from reflux disease. So we don't have the actual data to support this yet to say that's the number, but it was expert opinion from clinical um, experience. The histopathology is isolated the esophagus, which makes it somewhat of a fascinating disease. There's not gastric, there's not duodenal involvement. Other causes of the inflammation need to be ruled out. And as a part of this most recent recommendations, the term PPI responsive esophageal eosinophilia was born. And, and those patients act as if they have um, esophageal dysfunction. They may have heartburn. They may have food that's getting stuck. They have a lot of eosinophils present in the epithelium, but their probe may be normal, suggesting that reflux isn't occurring, and everything gets better with a proton pump inhibitor. So we don't know whether this is a variant of reflux. We don't know if it's a type of eosinophilic esophagitis. So it's got this kind of vague in-between term now, and I think what we're learning from some basic studies is that actually PPIs can have an effect on the esophageal epithelium and diminish an inflammatory response. So work from um, Rhonda Souza and Stu Speckler and Adair Chang at Southwestern have shown that if you take epithelial cells, esophageal epithelial cells, and you stimulate them with uh, IL-13, that you get increased eotaxin expression, as you would suspect would be the case in a patient who had eosinophilic esophagitis. But if you treat those cells with a proton pump inhibitor, you have a decrease in the eotax eotaxin release. So that these medications may do more than we thought they do. And so clinically, that may be what we're seeing here. <clears throat> but it's an important area that I think you'll hear about over time. This phrase, diagnosis, was made by clinicians was put in because a lot of adult physicians are relying on the pathologist to make this diagnosis. They get the biopsy report and they say this is what it is and they've kind of forgotten the clinical context that the biopsy is obtained. So while it may seem somewhat ridiculous, it was uh, put there on purpose. And then finally, this, this last uh, phrase uh, or statement of rarely less than 50 may be diagnostic, and, and that was inserted because a lot of patients have comorbid allergic disease, and you may be on topical flow vent for asthma and swallow some of it, you may be on Flonase for allergic rhinitis, and you can partially treat the mucosa, and we have discussions about this all the time, geez, you didn't reach the threshold number, you must not have it, but, you know, if someone's a teenage boy's got food impaction repeatedly, has 12 eosinophils, and, and keeps coming in and doesn't get better with proton pump inhibitors, I mean, you know, you got to be a doctor first and, and kind of treat the patient, even though they may not have that threshold number. So this was another change that was put in to try to um, clarify things a little bit more. So uh, the conceptual definition, EOE, represents a chronic immune angina-mediated esophageal disease characterized clinically by symptoms, 
related to esophageal dysfunction, and histologically by eosinophil predominant inflammation. All right, now why combine this with food allergic disease? Well, we think that some of the chronicity may be due to chronic ingestion of foods that are allergenic, and we think that allergens are sparking some of this inflammatory response. It likely is due to foods, and when you take foods away, these, many of the patients get better. And I think one of the things that you probably appreciate in your practice, and we certainly see in our group, is there are going to be subtypes of this disease, eosinophilic esophagitis, and certainly probably the bulk of them have some kind of food allergen, but there may be some that are non-allergenic, and there may be some that are steroid responsive and some that are non-steroid responsive, but certainly a large group and some of the more classic description of this are food allergic <coughs> patients. So what are food allergies? They are immune mediated, which is really important to remember, right, to separate it out from other kinds of diseases that may be related to the ingestion of foods, but immune mediated reactions to specific food products, typically proteins that cause symptoms, in various target organs. It's reproducible to the food, resolves with the removal of the antigen. So these are a number of different important features and we'll talk about that as we go back to testing and looking at RAS testing. This is important to remember that it encompasses a lot of different kind of food allergies, right? On one end of the spectrum, peanut anaphylaxis, you eat a peanut. You get a reproducible reaction each time, you have a number of target organs, and you can die from that. You can diagnose it with IgE, RAST, and skin testing. Then you've got celiac disease. That's a food allergic disease too, right? It's a disease that is mediated by a cell-mediated disease. You have a reproducible reaction to wheat. You take the wheat away, you get better, another kind of food allergy. And eosinophilic GI diseases are probably somewhere in the middle, that, that some of them may be IgE-mediated, but we're not very good at understanding that yet, and so I go back to that kind of second point. We're only as good as our testing allows us to be, and right now, our ability to test for this ends up being somewhat limited. All right, um, when you think about food allergens, there are a number of different considerations, and, and actually this is one of the reasons that I moved to, to uh, back out west to, to Denver was to work with National Jewish Health and the allergists there who are have an outstanding experience both with the clinical as well as the pathophysiological aspects of food allergies. And Dan Atkins has provided me with some of these slides and really has taught me a lot about what food allergies are. And, and I think that in thinking about what the bioavailability is of the proteins that are ingested is, is really critical because there are a number of different factors that can contribute to that. So the food itself, uh, is it ripe or not? Has it been cooked or not? Were they treated with enzymes, additions of other ingredients, combinations of the above? And, and I think about um, that as it may be related to foods like wheat. So Dan always tells this story about, you know, he, he had, there's a, a patient who had um, this reaction to wheat, and, and, but then the RAS testing was negative, and, and so they brought the, the flour down that the family used, and they skin tested with the flour, and we'll show you some of that in a second, but, but it turned out the wheat had uh, mites in it. You know, they were from Houston, it was real, you know, and, and so it was actually an allergy to mites, not the wheat. So you got to think about all these different things that it may not be the exact food, but it could be other components. Um, after you eat it, there's interactions that can uh, hide or mask the allergens with matrix effects, enzymes, pH changes. It's been brought up already. What's the role of the microbiome in, in inflammatory diseases? What's the role of proton pump inhibitors? There's a, a small amount of data suggesting that actually proton pump inhibitor, inhibitors may increase the risk for developing allergic diseases. So all these things can contribute to the allergenicity of foods. <clears throat> All right, what's the testing we have? I think the most classic testing we have now is the RAST test that looks for an IgE that is specific for a food protein. And um, all those do is test for food sensitization. So you're looking at a food-specific IgE detected by blood testing, all right? And, and with RAST testing, there have been a number of different level set on population-based studies that for certain allergens or certain proteins that you could say there's a high likelihood of having an allergic response. And then a food allergy is actually a reproducible physical response 
to IgE mediated foods. So in this situation, in the slides I'll show you coming up, that this really talks about IgE mediated food responses, and that's what a lot of the literature based around EOE is, uh, discusses. All right, I'm going to come back to this slide in a second. I mean, this this slide just shows, you know, how do you do these testing? There's a little poker right up here that you can use. We don't inject, or the allergists don't inject the food below um, deeper in or an interdermal injection. It's on the uh, very superficial surface. You can surface. You can have both the wheel as well as the flare that are measured, and it's uh, based on the fact that you get an allergen placed there and you show that there's actually a response that the body has, and you can see here, here's your histamine control and there's your positive milk. So this is skin testing, and um, there are a number of different uh, factors that go along with, with food allergy or skin prick testing. I, I show you this slide because it's a really great resource. It's uh, encyclopedic in, in the volume that's there and the detail that's present within this, but I think if you're interested in food allergies, it's worth looking at because it addresses just about every kind of clinical uh, scenario you could think about with respect to food allergies. And um, within this, uh, the description of skin prick testing states that it's safe and useful for the diagnosis of IgE-mediated food allergies. The reagents and methods are not standardized, which is something I really never completely appreciated. You can get extracts for those proteins from a number of different companies, so they're not always incredibly standardized across different companies. So you can get different extracts depending on the company. Positive skin prick tests correlate with the presence of allergen-specific IgE-bound mast cells, and compared to oral food challenges, they have a low specificity and a low positive predictive value for making a diagnosis of food allergies. Allergen-specific IgE or RAS tests are useful for the diagnosis of IgE-mediated food allergy, but not diagnostic. So again, going back to that second, or that the first point I met was these aren't diagnostic. They need to be taken in the clinical context in which they were obtained. There are cutoff values for certain foods, proteins, and uh, for certain populations. Um, so let me go back. All right, so the variability that I spoke about before, and again, you know, I'm not an allergist, and that's the reason I moved to Denver was so I could work with allergists, and I learned a lot from them. So this is um, things that they've taught me about, certainly. The, the allergen extract, as I said, can be variable depending on companies. The devices used can be um, different. The skin test technician, the how hard the allergen is applied varies depending on who's doing it. Uh, difficulty with application, you've got a, a child who's moving around that it may be hard to actually apply that in a standardized way. Sensitivity to, of the skin to pressure, changes in level of sensitization depending on age. And then one of the really important things is medications. <clears throat> and we've learned through certainly trial and error, there are a lot of medications obviously that can cause differences in the way that those are read. The most telling would be an antihistamine, right? You need to stop Benadryl or Zyrtec or any of those before you have these testings done. But one of the really interesting collaborations that's happened or the, the things that we learn from each other's uh, subspecialty is amitriptyline actually has some antihistaminic effects. So that is now on the list of about 20 medicines that people need to stop before they come and see us to make sure that we get valid skin testing. So a lot of different things can go into to skin testing. Now I just wanted to show you this slide again because this is one of the things that Dan and David Fleischer have taught me a lot about in, in thinking about how do you do allergy testing. And so there's the standard commercial extracts that you can use, but there's also the ability to use fresh foods. And so you may, someone may say, geez, I, every time I eat, and that was the case with the child who had the wheat problem, you know, I eat the wheat and I have this symptom, and you do all the routine testing for wheat and it comes back negative. But then what Dan had done was taken, had the family bring in the wheat and then made it into a slurry and put it on the skin, and then there was the reaction, and then we looked at it under the microscope and were able to see that. So it's a real valuable way to do this because you're actually relying on the food that someone's eating. And so we have families come in with a bag full of the foods, and then they're prepared and, and put on the skin to do testing. And it, and it has helped us identify some food allergens that we probably, in fact, we didn't identify with traditional testing. So uh, may be valuable. This is something that they're uh, writing up right now as to um, the utility of this <coughs> over time. Okay, so let's see. What do we know? 
how often, what's the frequency of allergic diseases in children who have eosinophilic esophagitis. And this is a slide that um, was modified from the TIGER subset. It shows the different studies that have been formed over time, the number of patients, the amount of allergic sensitization, so were there positive RAS tests, the amount of other comorbid allergic diseases shown here, and then anaphylactic food allergies that were identified in the different patient groups. And, and you can see it's kind of all over the place. I mean, there's large ranges, and, and I think a lot of this depends on who's doing the reporting. And I certainly know before I moved out, I, I didn't do a very good allergy history. And, and I think if you look at some of these, there are some that allergists wrote and some that gastroenterologists wrote. And so you're getting a, a wide range of numbers there. One of the really exciting things about this field is that there is a lot more crosstalk between allergy and GI now. And I think that if you examine any kind of uh, piece of the literature, see if there are um, uh, collaborations within that group because that will help you identify whether in fact um, or how valid some of that data might be. All right, what's the rationale for allergy evaluation? Uh, most patients have some form of comorbid allergic disease. In our group, it's about 76% have some other form of allergic disease. Patients are sensitized. They can have seasonal variability of symptoms. And this is a really important one because, as I said, there's um, maybe patients that have uh, only activity during the spring. And there's a lot of cross-reactivity between certain pollens and certain foods. So you may only see them during certain times of year coming in, and then you know they're coming in with that, so you can actually pre-treat them and get them through their season and, and go on. So um, that's one of the rationales for that. And then obviously improvement on elim elimination diets. I think you know, what we feel is that, again, going back to my very first slide, you want to treat the mucosal surfaces of the patient who have allergies because they have asthma or eczema or allergic rhinitis. And if we can keep all of those mucosal surfaces dampened and not having that allergic response, we think that it's also helping the esophagus. And we don't know that. We don't have the data for that yet. But that's some of the rationale for working together collaboratively. <clears throat> all right. What's the data to support the use of uh, or that allergens, food allergens may be the case. Um, this is the, the classic article from 1995, in which Kelly and colleagues show that an elemental formula brought resolution of symptoms, brought resolution of histopathology, and upon reintroduction of food, both return. This uh, slide, again from the Tiger's slide set, shows that um, whether it's a dietary restriction that's empiric, as Amir Kagawala showed us, dietary restriction based on specific food testing, as Jonathan Spurgle has shown, or dietary elimination based on uh, elemental uh, diet, that you get a significant improvement in symptoms and, a, and eosinophilia with the blue bars, and the orange bars show that there's a decline in the numbers of eosinophils, what that baseline level ends up being. So these all work, going back to the slide where there's the question, you know, what, what's effective? You know, 75%, I mean, if you have Crohn IBD, you get something that works 75% of the time, it's pretty good, right? So these things <clears throat> work, and I think some of the complexity of this are probably finding out who the, the patients are that they may be most beneficial in. I think the other thing that I'd point out that you'll see, I think over the course of time, and I hope we're going to learn, is that most of the studies to date have been done in um, more subspecialty centers or tertiary care centers. So we're looking at patients who have probably been through a number of other treatments, and now we're getting this other uh, form of, of evaluation and treatment. And I think there are a lot of patients who don't need to go to a subspecialty center and cared for just fine. And, 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 and it will be interesting to see over time what a bigger broad-based population of, of treatment studies will look like. Okay, so let's go back to our uh, two patients. Um, this is the two-year-old boy that we talked about. <laughs> and um, so he was on Lensoprazole. He got started on uh, Flovent. And to treat the comorbid food allergic disease was provided an EpiPen. Um, he had allergy testing that was positive both uh, by skin pricked as well as IgE for um, a series of foods. So why don't we just, maybe we can take a pause. How are we with time, Ann? We, okay? 
Okay. So, you know, how many people use proton pump inhibitors for treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis? All right. So, the bulk of people. Anyone want to say what the rationale is for using that? Ann, director. Yeah, so, you know, don't know what the inflammation may be due to. You know that the esophagus isn't working very well. Symptoms may be related to acid exposure. So it certainly is reasonable to use that at initial stages as you're making a diagnosis and in, in starting up treatment. Now, I think the long-term use of proton pump inhibitors for patients who have strictly eosinophilic esophagitis, we don't know that yet. And I think we use that primarily for symptoms of heartburn or things like that, or other comorbid allergic uh, uh, reflux disease. And there are probably patients who have a little bit of both. But I think <clears throat> we don't use it long term, but it may be useful for uh, on a PRN basis. All right, Flovent. How many people use Flovent or some kind of topical steroid, I guess? So again, no, I mean, actually less than before, okay? Half of an arm going up and down, yeah. All right, anyone want to say why or what their experience has been with Flovent or topical steroids? Mark? Very good. Yeah. Perfect. So there's, you know, it, it is, and, I, and in my experience, topical steroids have been very beneficial. You know, the idea is that the saliva coats the esophagus and, um, <clears throat> And there have been other vehicles that have been used now, including Splenda. And, you know, you can have a lot of discussions about what the utility of the specific vehicle is. Um, I would say probably not sugar-based things, not honey. Uh, we have uh, a lot of people, Hershey syrup, they're all different kinds of things that people have used. The problem with those is, what's the one complication we watch for with topical steroids? Canada infection, right? And then where does Canada like to grow? Where it's sweet, where it's dark, where it's wet. So that's your esophagus. And now you've got a Petri dish all set up for, for a Canada infection. So I try to avoid something that's going to be sugar-based if, um, if a family is not going to, <clears throat> you know, do that. I'll bring up another topical story that we've uh, just published on, seclesonide or Alvesco. Um, it's uh, another topical story that's been used for asthma, it's used for eczema or allergic rhinitis, and the benefit of that is it has a very high local concentration because it's esterified on the surface epithelium, so you probably get a local concentration that's higher and there's not as much systemic absorption. So um, topical steroids are, are, I think, very valuable. And Mark brings up the really important point that we <clears throat> wrestle with often with families. And they say, geez, you know, uh, we take it, we get better, but then when we stop it, it comes back again. And one of the biggest <clears throat> problems that we have is, is long-term compliance for this. And, and we try to keep our patients in remission because we think that by doing that, we're reducing the chance of having long-term complications, such as strictures or food impactions. We don't have the data for that yet. We think that's the case. We hope that's the case, but um, it's hard to always get teenage boys to take their puffer or stay on a diet. So we do try to impress upon families that it's a chronic disease, that you need to be on something to keep inflammation under control. And the social history comes into play here a lot because uh, being in Colorado, people do backwoods hiking, they're hunters, and if they're off in the middle of nowhere, they get a food impaction with a piece of dry jerky, that's not good. So we let them know that here's what you may need to do, and, and actually if you're going to be doing something like that, it may be good to pre-treat yourself before so you don't literally get stuck. <clears throat> So um, then food uh, restrictions. Who uses dietary restrictions in the treatment of patients? So great. Even more maybe than topical flow vent. And I guess show of hands, how do you pick which food to pull out? Is it RAS testing? Sometimes skin testing? Just because you, by history, identify foods? Okay. So, you know, and, and I think we're trying to understand now what and how the best way is to do. And like I said, it, 
National Jewish, we do have, <coughs> you know, the privilege to work with some people, but it's it's a very imprecise art, you know, to be honest. And at the allergy meetings, um, there were the the pre-meeting course, there are about 800 allergists there asking how do you identify the food. So it's still not terribly clear. We try to use skin testing to identify foods that there are IgE mediated sensitizations to. We use RAS testing to identify which foods have a high level of sensitivity. And those foods, based on the dietary history, are the ones that end up being pulled out. So in general, that's one of the ways that we do it. And we can always talk about the specifics. I'm happy to you know, talk to people about that also. So um, this boy also went on to elemental formula supplements um, because he wasn't eating enough to grow. Uh, he did have uh, uh, calories added <coughs> with those supplements and also got calcium and vitamin D. He was referred to the feeding specialist because he had a pretty severe feeding aversion, and, and it's not unusual for us to see that because the patients um, have just grown so ingrained into a pattern of eating that it takes a while for that to get better, even when the inflammation's better. So it's one of the things just to watch for and, and um, be cognizant of. All right, 17-year-old boy we talked about before. Again, uh, we, we used esomeprazole for him, and, and primarily because of the uh, comorbid reflux disease, topical flow vent uh, for him because he w was not terribly excited about going on an extensive elimination diet. Um, he did get uh, education about food allergies, and um, we tried to have him increase his fruit and vegetable intake just <clears throat> because of uh, some constipation that he was also having and a multivitamin added. So I, I think, you know, one of the other important points about nutrition is that um, I, I'm certainly not trained in, in how to administer a diet restrictions. And one of the, our nutritionist, Michelle Henry, just completed a study at the APFED conference, the uh, advocacy groups conference that was held in Denver. And, and it turned out that she asked families where they get their primary information about food restrictions. And 60% was from the physician, and 30% never met with a dietitian. And, um, you know, most dietitians, I would say, have some training in food allergies, so certainly for the more common foods that uh, they can administer at least uh, instructions for how to remove those foods. And I think even more importantly, making sure that the uh, amount of calories and micronutrients that are obtained are, are present within the diet. So I think it's important to engage with your dietitian. And I think if you're caring for a lot of the patients or you, you're using diet restriction, to have a discussion with them about some of the needs that those patients might have over time. I think. Yeah, that's it. So any other questions for you? Hey, that was excellent. Um, first question, uh, in my practice, it's mostly boys. Any idea why that is? Yeah, th there's... Um, okay, with not, eosinophilic esophagitis. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I don't. That, but it's pretty consistent, I think, in practice and certainly within the, the literature that it's about three quarters... Um, uh, the studies are affect, have males affected, and, and the other is that, and this is not in the literature, but my experience has been some of the most difficult patients to care for from an inflammatory standpoint are, are the female patients. It, they, the, I don't know why, but it's much harder sometimes to get them under control. And can we expect uh, better suggestions or a protocol for deciding how often to do surveillance uh, endoscopy in the future for kids? Yeah, so, you know, the, the question I think, and there's a couple different reasons that the question may come up, is when and how often do you do endoscopies? And this goes back a little bit to philosophy, okay? Part of our practice has been uh, make the diagnosis, <clears throat> start a treatment, get, people get the patient asymptomatic, and then repeat the endoscopy to make sure that they're histologically in remission. The reason we do that is we want to know a treatment that works. So resolve symptoms, resolve histopathology, and then as diets are broadened or medications are tapered, we can always go back to something that worked, all right? After that second endoscopy, you're gonna have, you could ask every one of us and get a different answer, all right? And, and it again goes back a little bit to individualizing treatment. Some families were not ever having an endoscopy again. Some wanna have one every day of their life. You know, and, and so it's a little bit of a discussion. We are probably on the more conservative or liberal end that we don't do 
maybe we certainly don't do them every day and and we may not do them every year but certainly if the the message to the family is we need to do something with the results okay so if you're having a flare and you're not getting better with what we think should make you better then we'll do an endoscopy to see if the inflammation is persistent if there's an infection that may be brewing if there's some other reason that you may be having symptoms so um, are we and, and we have a discussion with them to tell them we're not going to be as aggressive because it doesn't cause cancer, at least from data to date, and not every patient gets a stricture. And some people are okay with that, and some really want you to be much more aggressive and, and looking often. So I think it's a little bit of a discussion point, and, and it drives families crazy because we don't, we can't give them an answer of we're gonna do one every six months, or we're gonna do one every year. I have a question. Uh, one is related to patch testing and whether your groups, uh, is that something you advocate for? What do you think? I know the norms are even less standardized than the yeah. skin prick test, but do you, have you found it gives you information if you do do it? Yeah, so patch testing is, is it's a great tool that was developed to look at um, sensitization and allergic responses to metals, okay, skin reactions. And it's been modified and used in uh, and very successfully by several groups to look at um, eosinophilic esophagitis. And, and the bulk of that literature is arriving from CHOP, and it's very uh, convincing, I think, certainly for exclusion of some foods from the diet. Even more so than the things I had showed you before about variabilities of skin testing, I think it applies even more so to patch testing. So the specific way you do it with foods and the specific readouts from that can be even more variable. So we have not embarked on the use of that as much, um, and certainly in a prospective fashion. I think it certainly deserves more study, and, and I think the standardization of that is, is what's really important. Yes? Can you comment a little bit on the management, the nutritional management of patients with eosinophilic gastroenteritis? Because I have a patient that's been very difficult to manage. You know, how do you take care of someone who's got eosinophilic gastroenteritis? And, and I like to really think about uh, all the eosinophilic GI diseases as where is the inflammation, okay? And this goes back a little bit to my first slide. If you think about the gut, it's this incredible organ, series of organs that's separated by sphincters, okay? It's got, you've got your esophagus, it's got one on the top and the bottom. you got your stomach that's, you know, you just go through and they're all separate. So they're different organs, right? And they have different epithelia and they have a different set of immune organs or immune cells present there. So in our experience, it's been that the lower down the inflammation is, the less like, likely we are outside of the infant, infant's age of finding a food, okay? So esophagus, we're pretty good at it. The stomach, we're okay. But when you go down further, we're not very good, and we don't find a, um, a food allergen. Now, that's not to say it's probably, again, going back to point number two, that we just don't have the tools yet to understand what it might be, because many of the patients do get better if you use an elemental formula, and you take away all the allergens. Now, that's not to say that it's because you're removing all the allergens, but it may be doing something else to reset the... Uh, immune barostat of the, of, the, of the different organs that are there. So we'll test for food allergens if a patient has inflammation in the stomach, small intestine and colon. We'll go ahead and do it. If there's a very strong response, then we'll try to pull that food out and see whether the patients have a symptomatic response. Often they don't. If they don't, then we'll use topical steroids as a first line. We may need to use systemic steroids depending on if they're, uh, how symptomatic they are and what the laboratory abnormalities that may be associated with it. So if they're terribly anemic or hypoalbuminemic, then we may go toward that first. It's rare um, and pretty unusual to need to go to systemic immune suppression. And those patients who have that degree of abnormalities or they are sick. I mean, they're having diarrhea and they're bleeding. I think that's more of an inflammatory bowel disease in the you know, classical sense, and it just may have an eosinophil predominance. And, and those patients I work with you know, are IBD guys on. Does that answer things? <laughs>